I'm Bill Hazel, and I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I have had this position now for about six and a half years, and I don't know what it's like around the rest of the country, but um, secretary years in Virginia are a little like dog years. And six and a half times seven is roughly 45 human years I've been at this. And um, who, who went to the Harvard thing with AFSA last fall and Antonio? You know, remember they had the thing about Moses? Um, you know, the guys talked about Moses. Uh, well, um, five, this is 45 human years, and Moses was only in the wilderness for 40 years. <laughs> and he died. <laughs> and he didn't get to the promised land. <laughs> and what I learned from Dr. Heifetz is that, <clears throat> that Moses had a bad strategy. And uh, in, as, at, in this, yes, it's true. Uh, <laughs> So, so the challenge, the challenge you have coming in as, as secretary, you're going to do all these great things in, in the six and a half years I've been at this, and I come from the world of orthopedic surgery, many of you know. I practiced surgery, I actually did six cases the week after I became secretary and realized that was really stupid. But the, the, you know, all this issue for me started with health information exchange and what we would call patient pong as we sent people from one place to the next place to the next place. And only twice in the last 24 hours have been, I, I've been accosted by someone who says, why can't you doctors get the papers done once and share them? <laughs> Still, it ain't working. Bothered by the fact that we heard both Chris Traver and Tremenda say this morning that our, our silos continue on now in Virginia, you know, what do we call those in Virginia? We've taught you this before. They are our cylinders of excellence. <laughs> and, and it's important you understand that. It is Virginia after all. But the, the challenge of, of getting this data to share the information to pass is really important. And so on this little panel, we have representatives of public health, health care, education, and housing. And we've been fighting all of those um, issues in Virginia of trying to bring the data across. But let me talk just for a moment. We're going to talk a little bit about social determinants of health and how we share. And uh, in 2002, McGinnis had an article in Health Affairs which outlined the determinants for premature death. 10% related to health care, 5% environmental, 15% um, I'm trying to read my writing, excuse me. I'm practicing, I'm like a doctor in social circumstances. 30% genetic predisposition and 40% behavioral. So if all of this is what causes house health outcomes and I as secretary am in the health business, am I not by HIPAA allowed to use any of this information for delivery of care, for management of care, for um, payment? and for auditing by HIPAA? Isn't that what's supposed to happen? So why are we having these barriers? Barriers. It says in the law that I should be able to do all of these things as secretary. I'm a covered entity. All I need with you all is a business associate agreement. I should. But let's think on that a little bit. Why are we making this harder than we need to be? In Virginia, we've created, a, we've used some of the SIM money to create a plan for well-being and to talk about what it is, just a few things. Economic stability is important in well-being. It's one of our measures. Another is uh, the preparation of kids for pre-K. Are they ready to learn? The brain's developed. We need information about how children are doing to know how they are going to do in school. We need to know what they're doing at third grade reading level. And truly, in a, play, in a community that has well-being, we've got to know if they've graduated. And when they graduate, are they ready to work or go on to higher education? I need, Emily, education information to know whether our programs are working. I'm picking on Emily because she's now the privacy fellow with the Department of Education, um, but she knows this better than I do. So these are all things that are, are really important as we, as we go forward. So what we'll do is we will go um, typical out of order in the program, but we're going to start with Margo Edmonds. Margo is the Vice President for Evidence Generation and Translation at Academy Health. No, I'm sorry. Margo goes last. I've already screwed up. Um, 
Paula goes first. Yeah. Paula Soper, MSMPH PMP, Senior Director, Public Health Informatics Association of State and Territorial Health Officers. Emily Kulik is the Privacy Fellow for the US DOE and from Allegheny County, so she's out there for a year trying to learn them something. And Rafael Diaz is the Chief Information Officer for the US Department of Housing and Urban Development until your term ends at the end of the year or early next year or sometime. And then, and then that's Margo down there. So why don't we come up, uh, start with you, Paula. Sounds good. Find a place for my water without spilling on anything. Okay. So <clears throat> I don't know if anybody has had an opportunity to look at uh, Human Services 2.0 over there, but I'm going to talk to you today a bit about Public Health 3.0. Um, we're, I guess, a version ahead. I think that's a good thing. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with public health, um, we've really come through a, a few versions of public health. The first one really um, started way back when, you know, beginning of the Industrial um, Revolution, and very much a focus on infectious diseases, um, how do we uh, you know, get people vaccinated, um, you know, the advent of antibiotics and, and um, the wonderful things that was able to do. Um, but there is still a tremendous amount of variation uh, in the capacity of state and local tribal and territorial health departments out there. Um, certainly epi and lab capacity, epidemiology and lab capacity grew during this time period. Um, and about 19, uh, mid 1980s, um, the Institute of Medicine started looking at um, what what is the future of public health. So in 1998, there was a report published, and um, this is kind of the the beginning of public health 2.0. Um, and during in, in this report, um, the Institute of Medicine identified three core functions. Um, Policy, um, uh, was it policy, assurance, and oh goodness, assessment. assessment thank you. <laughs> I'm up here and forgetting. Uh, I knew there were two A's. Um, and 10 essential functions that public health uh, should be able to offer to communities. Uh, during this time period, uh, there is an accreditation movement within public health to begin to accredit governmental public health agencies. Also beginning to look at multiple risk factors and longer time frames um, in this time period, really beginning to look at um, chronic conditions uh, and how to address um, chronic conditions. And public health has really had a focus on health equity um, pretty much since its roots, but beginning to understand and look at the social determinants of health really started in this public health 2.0 time frame. Um, and you know, we're also operating now in more of a corporate, during this time frame, more of a corporate model of, of health care. So in Public Health 3.0, um, our, our future for public health, um, we're moving toward full accreditation, so a, a, a real um, robustness in governmental public health agencies. Um, a focus more on lifespan and generational. We had some discussion earlier about two generations, and public health is really beginning to learn from our human services uh, friends that this is a really important perspective to take. Um, also, looking at new partners, all of you, <laughs> um, to focus on the social determinants of health. We don't, um, you know, we've, we've had, I think, an understanding of the impact of social determinants of health for a little bit longer, but we don't hold all the cards, um, and it's important to work with all of our partners um, to really be able to impact the upstream um, social determinants. And in this, this era, we're really looking toward um, technology and tools to help move us forward. Um, I should also probably say standards and interoperability as well. So what did this public health 2.0 system look like where we're really living right now? Um, if you can see, you might not be able to, but public health is at the, the center of that um, social network diagram. And 
Public health does indeed play a really important convening role. Um, and we, you know, we define our system, you probably all don't know that we, we consider you all part of the public health system. Um, because this is the, the, our working definition of a public health system, all public, private, and voluntary entities that contribute to the delivery of essential public health services within a jurisdiction. And schools, you know, provide health care, housing, you know, there, there are so many um, things that all all of you do or all of your organizations do that impact the public's health. So you may not know it, but we consider you part of the family. <laughs> um, and we have, you know, we, as I said, we've focused in this, in this era, public health being the convener. Um, but this is still, I think, a bit of a limited focus. So in Public Health 3.0, um, you know, we're, we're looking to be at the table as well as be a convener. So why, why is Public Health 3.0 an imperative? Well, certainly ACA um, ha and has been a huge driver for public health um, movement with, uh, um, Bill mentioned um, their SIM grant. Um, social determinants of health have finally become something that we're talking about at the national level and in healthcare. We also understand that you know zip codes and where people live and work and play is is a bigger um, driver for people's health uh, determinants of their health and their genetic code. As as Bill just you you just gave me the perfect lead in. Thank you. <laughs> um, and that we all have a collective societal responsibility to create the conditions that, that allow people to be healthy, make healthy choices, uh, live in healthy environments. Um, but you know, I couldn't have, have a presentation like this without silos, of course. Um, and you're not the only one to call them silos of excellence. I've heard cylinders. Cylinders. cylinders of excellence, sorry, cylinders of excellence. Um, and, and I have heard folks, re, you know, refer to silos as, you know, silos can be a good thing, and and um, we can, you know, perfect and have really great data systems. But it's that connection, you know, it's that it's that building. If if nothing ever came out of a silo, it'd be kind of useless. Um, but right now, you know, in public health, we are still developing our own programs within silos. Um, and we know we've got a lot of missed opportunities both within our own domain, but then across, um, across domains as well. So as I mentioned, you know, Public Health 3.0 um, emphasizes cross-sectoral um, environmental policy and systems level action. Um, and it's challenging not just governmental folks, um, but also business leaders and community leaders, policy makers, um, to be part of the solution and to be more expansive across economic development, education, transportation, food, um, food insecurity, of course, is huge, a huge issue, um, safe neighborhoods. Um, so those are really the drivers. And I just want to leave, um, I think I'm probably not going to have time to tell a quick story, but in terms of the interoperability, where do we need to be for interoperability for Public Health 3.0? Um, we need modernized information systems to support new standards and technologies. Uh, we need interoperability that can facilitate multi-sectoral data and information sharing at the micro, at the individual level, and at the population level. Um, HHS is really focused now on modern tools, um, analytic models, uh, predictive modeling, um, you know, building those kinds of tools that can help um, us make better decisions um, and ideally bringing in data from different sectors to help with, with policy decision making. Um, and then funding policy and standards to support this modernization and interoperability. So if I could just quickly, okay, thank you. <laughs> so just a quick case study. Um, don't, don't stress him. That was one of the rules Daniel said, don't stress him. I'm sorry, stress I'm him. sorry, I'm sorry. I just want to quickly, quickly ask this question. Um, how many folks here either knew about or were involved in the Healthy Communities Access Program? Okay, a few, a few, okay. Well, I had the great privilege of working with um, a, a region uh, out in 
out in Big Sky Country, let's put it that way. Um, and working with a health and human services collaborative on um, a community health assessment. And they were really forward thinking. Um, it really pushed me, this is 15 years ago, really pushed me as a public health professional um, about how to think about a community health assessment. We really looked at those social determinants of health and how to pull data from across all of those different areas. So I won't go into, there's a, a little bit of a case study here. I won't go into the details of that so I don't stress you. I'm finishing. <laughs> Um, but think about, and I mean, it was um, miserable to try to get data from multiple different sectors and sources and create a really robust um, community health assessment that looked at social determinants and human services. And let's think about how we can do that in a public health 3.0 model with interoperability to move our, the needle forward on the social determinants of health. Okay, missing one slide. Um, so I, most of my work in this space was with Allegheny County Department of Human Services. I right now am on a temporary assignment with the US Department of Education. So I'm gonna share a little bit of both of those perspectives today. I just wanna caveat up front that they are two totally independent perspectives. So when I share some of the work that's going on in Allegheny County, it's of course not any representation of, of Department of Education. Um, so I'll start with Allegheny County Department of Human Services home of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and we have an integrated human services department there. So we integrated in the 90s and administer services like child welfare, mental health, drug and alcohol, homeless and housing supports, aging, as well as a host of, of prevention and diversion services. So right around the time that we integrated, we also started investing in a data warehouse to integrate data at that client level. Um, since then, we've been adding a lot of additional resources or, or partnering with other agencies in our community to share data. So we also have um, data coming in from our assisted housing providers. Um, we have birth records. We have a lot in the criminal justice space, so information from the courts, from, um, from jail, from, newly from police and probation, and also have been forming since 2010 partnerships with our local public school districts. Um, so we have 42 public school districts in our county, and as of last Friday, actually, we're up to 19 um, partners um, within that space. So the ways that we use the integrated data, first and foremost, is for individual care. The reason we created the system in the first place was to better coordinate care for our clients. Um, so there's a front end to that data warehouse that's essentially an electronic human services record, and we call it client view, where, for instance, a child welfare caseworker can look up one of their clients and see what mental health services they've been receiving, have they accessed any of our emergency shelters, have they been involved in the criminal justice system, um, as well as a lot of other things. And we just, within the last year, redesigned that, and one of the great parts about this now is that there is a portal for clients themselves to access their human services record, um, both to help them manage their own care, and then it's it's also a step for us in terms of transparency on, on really letting our clients know what information we have on them and allowing them to see it in the same way that, that our workers see that information. Um, the second category, um, the way that we use the integrated data is for management decision making. So this on the flip side is using aggregate data for analysis to understand trends in the community, trends in need and service utilization, help us evaluate programs, cost benefit analysis, really ultimately trying to inform leadership so that they can make decisions to maximize our funds and, and best serve clients. And then the third way that we're using data is really for community use, so making it available publicly through tools. Um, the example I put up here is a neighborhood indicators website where you can look up, for instance, mental health involvement by census tract or other geographic boundaries. And then we also have an IRB-like process for external research partners to get access to that integrated data. I'll talk a little bit about our, our education partnerships. So these are our formal data sharing partnerships with school districts. We get data from them to our human services agency every week, um, three files of data on all students that are, that are in their districts. And there's 
two ways that we think about using this data. First is really getting in, in the hands of workers, so getting it where it's needed. So for instance, a child welfare, welfare caseworker can see up-to-date information, so every week um, for children on their caseload, uh, you know, had they missed days of school, um, school suspension incidents, whether or not they have an IEP, administrative data that comes directly from the school district. It's published in their child welfare case management system, and this year we just started a pilot that's an email alert that goes out to caseworkers, understanding they don't have the time to go in and look at an education page within their case management system every week. So really to get that information to them on a Monday so they can understand what happened in the previous week, were there any education concerns. Um, that's, it's great, it gives them information early so that they can intervene early. Um, and it's really for us just the first step. It's a critical first step, but the harder, piece of that is what we're working through now, which is what do you do about it? So if a child welfare caseworker knows that a child they're working with missed, for instance, two days of school last week, what are those strategies and interventions that are um, realistic for them to implement that really will improve those outcomes? Um, and then caveat that, of course, they only see that information if they have legal authority to do so. So if the child is adjudicated dependent, um, we know that from a direct connect to the court system or traditionally as we've done it, if there's a signed consent form from parents that gets uploaded into the system and then that essentially turns the data on for that um, caseworker. The second way that we use the education data is for aggregate analysis. Um, and this is really the bulk of our efforts in this space is an iterative action research model where we take an issue, analyze, use those insights to inform strategies and interventions, and then implement those and evaluate them. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through a lot of examples of that, but two of our focus areas have been um, first around chronic absenteeism, so looking at what are the strongest predictors of chronic absenteeism, looking not just at education indicators, but human services indicators, um, and exploring now, thinking about taking that to an early warning system. Um, and then the other space we've done a lot of work is around school stability for, for children in foster care. Um, so switching hats now um, to US Department of Education. I am um, working in the office of the Chief Privacy Officer, which is Kathleen Stiles, and you know, they really understand that to make effective data-driven decisions that you often need information from, from more than one agency. So they're really committed to helping the field in this area and really identify when these types of data sharing models are permissible and not permissible under FERPA and then how to go about doing that um, in best practices and really maintaining student privacy. Um, so my, my main project, which hopefully will be released this summer, is um, a guidance document that's intended for school districts and state educational agencies who are interested or considering and partnering in one of these integrated data systems. So exactly the model I just talked about in Allegheny County, and that's being done in other um, sites across the country, when and how that's permissible under FERPA and best practices around that. Um, the other guidance document that's currently in the works is um, for the WIOA um, performance reporting requirements. So that's a joint guidance document with Department of Labor. And we're in discussions with HUD and HHS, and really it's about identifying, you know, it's not just a crosswalk of FERPA and other privacy protections, it's taking a really specific use case, understanding what the field is trying to do and interpret those privacy laws and identify when and how that work is permissible. Um, and then the last thing I think is, you know, if you think the integrated data system guidance document is really just saying that this work is permissible, not in any way required. So I think the field wants this work because legal barrier is a, is a large barrier in implementing this, but there's a lot of other reasons that people say no to moving this work forward, and this is, this is only addressing one piece of that. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So good to be here, and I just want to let you all know that I'm not doing emails. I'm actually using this for my notes so that I can read my own handwriting. <laughs> uh, it's just such an honor to be here, and it's uh, such an honor to serve President Obama and be a part of his administration here at HUD. As a CIO, I've been had the privilege of working with some wonderful folks, and uh, to be here with you as well and hear this conversation, this is almost my dream because this is what I am training my IT folks to do, is to listen to these kinds of conversations and bring them back and determine how can we use technology 
as President Obama said, how can we use technology to help people's lives every day? How can we make people's lives better every day by using technology? And it, the way we do it is by listening to you and understanding what you're doing and how we can implement the technology. Because that's really the easy part. I know Chris was talking about the technology. It's really the easy part. It's the cultural change that's really the hard part. And so when, I actually, you can, you can actually talk to Georgia because I gave her my, uh, my presentation when, we were, when I answered question number two, talking about the barriers and what are the, how do we get to uh, these interoperable systems. It's really about the culture. And at HUD, the culture was one of very much siloed systems. It still is, but we're working to change that. And uh, so there are multiple facets to, to, to the cultural changes, and that's leadership, budget, and the um, IT systems. So you've heard of people, process, and technology. Well, we're looking at it from a leadership position, uh, change. And uh, one of the exciting things that has, has happened over the last two years in 2014, we had uh, a new secretary, Secretary Castro, who, has, who came in and brought in his own team and brought in new, uh, new deputy secretary, new assistant secretaries um, for all the program offices, a new CFO, a new CIO. And that cultural change um, from a leadership perspective has been ex very exciting to see how we're looking at changing the, now the processes and the technology that go along with that. <laughs> It's uh, been referred to as a second term change. And so, uh, but in the, in the second term, two years later. So it's been very exciting because we've got a, a very tight deadline to get, get things working and uh, working with the other agencies. Uh, so one of the things that, um, that we started to look at was from a budget perspective, how do we start to, um, how do we start to change the process for how IT gets done and IT gets funded within the agency. So we have an appropriation that's one big number that comes in, but what was happening was the office of the CIO was handing out the money to the program offices and letting them build their own IT systems. And so we said we're not gonna do that any longer. We're gonna tell the program offices that you can come to, to, to me, to this office of the CIO and say, what are your business requirements and then I will tell you the technology that we're going to use. I will determine how that, that business requirement will be implemented because I will now look at the third component is enterprise IT solutions. That was a huge game changer. And uh, talk about resistance to change. Uh, when you take away people's money <laughs> and their control over money, it gets to be a, a very difficult conversation. And so I think it was, I can't remember, when I walked in, somebody was talking about holding federal uh, officials accountable. It's about being held accountable for those funds, how they're being used, how they're being implemented. And we started with um, some very, some very uh, critical systems, a CRM system that we, we built with Microsoft. Uh, customer relationship management was critical. Uh, the how we manage our customers, and we have many levels of customers, was critical because we have, we still have, but we've now built the platform on which we will build an enterprise customer relationship management, over 20 different customer relationship management uh, systems and phone numbers, uh, uh, over 80 different 1-800 numbers, many of them were not even being used. So this, these are types of issues that we started to deal with and to look at it from an interoperability within HUD. Uh, so that was a very exciting opportunity. And when we started to look at over all the projects that were going on, there were m many duplicative projects. So we, instead of looking at it from a program perspective, we started to look at these business requirements from a functional perspective. So we started to look at, for instance, FHA came to me and said, we need a new loan review system. I said, okay, well, what does that mean? What are those business requirements? What are your use cases, right? Well, how are you going to use that? Because then public and Indian housing came to me and said, we need a loan review system also 
for our loans that we guarantee. Well, basically, you've got one system there that has different rule engines that can be used interoperably and can be used uh, in a consolidated manner, and we can save uh, money by consolidating those two systems. So those are the types of examples that we started to identify. Um, voucher management system, we talked about uh, Andrea, there's, there she is. We talked about public housing and how we're managing our voucher management system. Uh, that we're look, we're re-looking at that because FHA has, uh, excuse me, PIH, Public and Indian Housing has a voucher management system, multifamily, FHA has a, 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 a system as well, and so we're looking at how do we consolidate those systems and be uh, more interoperable and share the data and be more effective with that data. So there's a, there were a number of issues there that we were able to take a look at. Um, let me look through my notes real quick. and. Uh, so much of the conversation that was going on earlier with uh, Shamendra about data standards and, and interoperability is what we're looking at within the, within the organization. And I came to, uh, before I came to HUD, I was in Illinois with Ivan working uh, as the Chief Information Security Officer. And the standards, how we share data was a huge issue. Uh, it took about two years for me to get into the Illinois Terrorism Task Force and to implement a cybersecurity committee on the Terrorism Task Force because folks didn't get that the, the, ter the, the terrorists are using cyber and not just boots and bullets. So that conversation is, a, is, a constantly, uh, is constantly going on uh, and in Illinois and now we're using those same interoperability standards here within within HUD for cybersecurity, um, and the analytics we're looking at our systems for the continuum of care folks that I was talking to Andrea about. How are each one of the continuum of care folks? These, some of them are statewide uh, homeless uh, management information systems. Some of them are countywide. Some of them are community-wide, so there are very different levels of the data that's going on there, and not at all. It takes a year for that data to come into HUD, so there's not, there's not at all any data sharing there. So we're looking at how do we implement a business analytics, a predictive analytics model for those systems so that we can help those folks determine what their, answer the questions that Melinda, I don't see her, Melinda was asking, right? How do we answer those questions and then answer more of those questions with um, better uh, data analytics? And then, again, as, as Christopher was talking about, the information exchange and how we're sharing data across boundaries. We're working closely with VA, and I just learned we're working also with uh, education. Um, but, so there's so many opportunities because fundamentally, as uh, Secretary Castro has said, HUD is the agency of opportunity. Ho housing is so critical, so fundamental to all the conversations that we're having. And there's this symbiotic relationship between housing and health, housing and education, housing and all these social determinants that we've been talking about, and how do we ensure that we're better sharing that data and becoming more effective with that data sharing. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. This is my second time at a Stewards of Change meeting. And um, I haven't um, had the opportunity to meet many of you yet, but I did want to say a little bit about what brought me here. I've been spending a lot of time in the health equity community um, with some people from the Institute for Alternative Futures. Anybody familiar with IF? Okay, so one of the things that they do in their meetings is they start with what brought you here? Why are you here? What's really important to you? Tell, tell a little bit about your story. So I'd like to indulge you for just a moment. Um, at the Institute of Medicine, they would call this declaring my biases. Um, so my professional life started here at Hopkins um, as a postdoc, and I was in the School of Public Health, and then I was a research and clinical fellow in the medical school. And this is where I discovered health policy, which I've been doing for the rest of my career. I taught it for 10 years. 
Um, I worked at the hospital for six years and saw a lot of patients was part of care teams where there was no information sharing. Um, I also learned an expression called across the street, which still lives here at Hopkins. Um, you're laughing, yes. So, so the medical school and the public health school are across the street from each other and not so much sharing even now. I actually shared this with Dean Clegg this morning. I told him I was going to say this and he kind of nodded. He didn't say anything. So. <laughs> And he left, right? Yeah. He left. <laughs> now, he's one of the people who does know how to go across the street, but it still it kind of became a metaphor for me about crossing the street. Um, so a little bit later in my career, I went to the Children's Defense Fund as the health policy director. And this was during the Clinton-Gore administration, which some of you um, may remember. And you remember that there was a children's health insurance program that was enacted into law as part of the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. And the Children's Defense Fund was one of the organizations that was helping roll out this program. There was a lot of leadership from the White House. And one of the things that the White House did was convene a, a group of private sector advisors, including somebody from the tech industry who donated a 1-800 line so that children and families from all over the country could call one number and be directed to the person to enroll in their program in the state. Um, there was also a task force internally in government, every public agency that touched families had to have a plan for how they were going to enroll kids in the CHIP program. And it was everything from schools and you know wh where you would think about food stamp programs. It was also parks and recreation and the national parks. So everybody who had an opportunity to interact directly with families needed to be at the table and have a plan. And I saw that unfold kind of from the inside, and I thought, this is a scale that we don't often get um, to, to work at the national level, but I found it just incredibly moving um, and met a lot of new partners. Uh, then I went, um, so I've been in academics and also in the nonprofit sector. Uh, then another big event, 9-11 and anthrax happened. And I was here at Hopkins as an adjunct faculty member, became part of the Center for Public Health Preparedness. And this was another place where it was really important to share information. This is where I was briefly on the faculty of the Information Security Institute. I learned about the culture of some of what you were talking about uh, this morning in terms of what we now call cybersecurity. Um, also a place where we really needed to share information and there was not a lot of healthcare information that was being shared. Some of our colleagues at RAND um, convened a group of people from professional associations, kind of same model we're using now, to talk about how all of us could begin to ramp up and understand that we need to, everybody needed to be a little more savvy about IT or informatics and everybody needed to know a little bit more about healthcare. There was a lot of sharing at that time um, that wouldn't have been possible before. Uh, a few years later, the Office of the National Coordinator was created, um, and I was, again, here at Hopkins, people in public health, medicine, still not quite as closely collaborating as we would hope. So I ha I've noticed a few things in, in the course of those travels, one of which is um, for policy, from a policy perspective, it's really important to make it easy to do the right thing make the right thing the easy thing to do, and often that means listening. Um, you need financial incentives, you need shared values, and you also need leadership around common problems. And these are some of the themes that I've been hearing this morning, and so I'm gonna, my reflections on what I heard this morning reflect those themes. Um, I have been writing a lot about interoperability and just wanna give a plug for an article called toward health, greater health, greater interoperability in, in healthcare. Allison Ryan, who you'll hear from tomorrow, I believe is gonna tweet the title and a link to an article that Academy Health just put out on interoperability. But I, I did uh, wanna notice for this panel that, um, that you started with the McGinnis and Fagey article, and I think that that was a real game changer in the field of public health. Um, people, it, it must have been quoted, I, I forgot to Google how many times it's, it's been cited. It's been cited a lot, but have we merged our systems yet? Not just a couple decades later. Um, so Paula talked about public health 3.0, and she also started with the Industrial Revolution, which I think is interesting, because I've now heard three times in the last two weeks in different meetings, people talking about our being at a stage of development in IT and, and data integration, which is very similar to the Industrial Revolution, that we're at a tipping point. 
Um, she also talked about uh, 2.0 and, and uh, what happened with the Institute of Medicine, Future of Public Health, another really galvanizing event for a lot of us in the field. Um, she also talked about sort of moving into being part of the solution, using tools and technology like predictive modeling to, to do something, not just to move the data around, but to actually have an impact. And then Emily talked about Allegheny County, which has been really one of the nation's leaders in developing integrated human services systems and doing data sharing with 19 partners. Um, and she mentioned that their goal was really to coordinate care. They had a shared problem. So everybody came, came together around a common goal. And they also have, I was very struck by your client portal. So not only is that for transparency, but that's also kind of empowering for people to know what's in their records. How many of us know it's in our actual electronic health record? Okay, are you Kaiser members? <laughs> <laughs> Kaiser does, I'm Kaiser member, does actually have access to information that comes from your visit summaries and your lab data, but does not yet, except in a few locations, share clinical notes from your providers. So kind of half empty, half full. Um, Emily also, so she talked about partnerships and problem solving, but I think behind the partnerships um, is a lot of governance and a lot of relationship building, which, we, which would take a long time to talk about. But she also talked about data reuse. So you don't just collect the data once, you reuse the data, repurpose it. And then Raphael was telling us about using technology to help people's lives every day, being inspired by our president. Um, there's certainly a lot of cultural changes that you have done at HUD, I think certainly that you did at the state level, but again, you know, you were talking about user-centered design of systems, or that's what I heard. So you don't just build a system and push it out. You engage your users from the very beginning, and that's what makes it meaningful. That's what makes it more effective. Um, that's what makes it um, the take-up rate higher. So in, it, just to sum up, I think what we're hearing is a lot of systems thinking um, and user-centered design, which finally, maybe the time is coming. Um, so I, I think also the people in the room here have shared values, which I've talked about a little bit, using technology to help people, um, whether it's cybersecurity or food security, I think a lot of the same principles apply. So I think we're going to move now into our conversation with the audience. Yep. Thank you for your time. All right, we just have a few minutes left. And remember, Daniel, we started late. Where's Daniel? Yeah, I just want to be sure we got that down uh, right. Um, one thing that was in the title was equity. And I did want to point out um, a little bit to this end in Virginia where we look at statistics on health such as uh, um, infant mortality, prematurity, and so forth, which are really, I think, good indicators of how well children will thrive or not in life. Um, there, are, there are, most of the population does fine. But if you look at our data, <clears throat> there is a subset that does not. And being able to use the data to show where those subsets are and to try to address the inequity, because it happens to go with uh, racial and cultural disparities, it has to go with areas of poverty, and we can see this in our work. So being able to pull that information out and focus on the areas that really need to have work are, are useful, but I did want to highlight the equity portion. Now, who's got questions for the panel besides me? I want to know what medicine Emily takes to make it be from Allegheny County and work at DOE in privacy. <laughs> um, but that's just personal. Don't answer that. Okay, who's got a question? Richard. Then, uh, right. my question's for Emily, and uh, I, I, I'm very excited about your your uh, prospective DOE, uh, and look forward to it. But putting your ha Allegheny County hat on, have have you had any uh, success yet in looking at uh, uh, predictors of the early? Um, uh, you said you were looking at early school truancy and what are the factors leading to that? And I'm just wondering if you have any uh, results yet. Sure. Um, so we right now are in our third iteration of that work. We're partnering with University of Pittsburgh. Um, our second round, I think we're, we're open to sharing folks. It's in, in draft form. And we looked at the indicators by grade level. Um, so I don't want to rattle off statistics right now, but I think one of them that was not totally surprising but rose to the top was whether or not children had a school change 
that year. Mm -hmm. um, so poverty obviously is a high indicator of juvenile justice involvement, but the school change was one that when we share this early findings with the community that they can really rally around because that's something that you can address both from preventing school change and then it's also a point of intervention when children have to change schools, what's the work that, that goes around that. Um, the third iteration that we're working on now is overlaying more place-based data. So everything in the current models is people-based, so human services and education indicators, but looking a lot at the communities in which folks have brought up today, the communities in which children are living, um, whether or not they are walking to school, are they getting a school bus, or are they on public transportation, lots of other indicators that, that are relevant for the community that they live in. Um, so all of that is still to come, um, but our website does um, publish a lot of our work along the way, so we're, we're happy to share that, and this fall is when I'll have a better answer for you, I think. Just to, to follow on, uh, in Virginia, I, we, we have learned from their, your experience and others that the housing is important for um, achieving at grade level. Uh, in the, and um, so one of our jobs this year was to get some budget to actually direct towards housing instability with the purpose of trying to keep kids in school the entire year. Um, so that's a housing issue. Rick. Yeah, this is a question for Paula. Uh, Margo mentioned um, the sort of chasm between public health and medicine or clinical health. I'm just curious the extent to which ASTO has projects going on today uh, along those lines to bridge the chasm relative to working, say, with CMS in the Medicaid side or with ACF in the children's area of social programs. Sure. Um, and I can't speak to all of our programs, um, but certainly um, we are very involved in, um, in some SIM work, um, providing technical assistance to jurisdictions with SIM grants um, to bring public health and health care together. Um, we've done a lot of work through um, the Million Hearts initiatives around bringing public health and health care together. Um, for more chronic disease kinds of issues. Um, with ACF, I'm, I'm not really familiar with any formal programs that we have that we've um, you know, begun opening the dialogue there. Um, but, but certainly, um, you know, the, the organization is you know, primarily funded by CDC, but we understand the importance of reaching out to other federal partners, and, and many of our members are doing this kind of work, boots on the ground. Um, so we learn from them and help support them as well. I have one question for you, Paul, sort of in follow-up. One of the things that we see is in public health reporting has to come from the practice of medicine. You see that in the emergency room where you see it in, uh, in practice, and we have this long list of things that need to be reported, and I'm absolutely 100% sure that it's not getting reported. Have you all worked in the HIE area to get um, the EMRs to cough up this information automatically or at least put prompts in in that community because I think it's something that we're missing. Did somebody plant that question? I did. <laughs> Actually, one of we, we have been working for a couple, three years now on something called the Public Health Community Platform, which is um, a, a national um, cloud-based platform with the intent of connecting all of public health and public health to healthcare and other partners. Our first um, major initiative is around electronic case reporting. Um, of those reportable conditions. And um, we have um, about 10, maybe a dozen pilots working on this right now, getting data. We're working with um, Epic and Cerner. Those are the, for those of you who don't know um, the, the EHR market, those are the two largest um, EHR vendors in the country. Uh, and we are also working with um, HIEs, um, with pilots in Washington State and in uh, Michigan, um, we are working on you know the standards, the trigger codes to get the data out of the EHRs into um, sending to public health. So this is a really large project for us, and um, lots of partners working on this. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. Boy, did that hit my sweet spot. I'm an ex. Uh, you have uh, a sweet spot. <laughs> a CIO of uh, the <laughs> Illinois um, Health Information Exchange. One of the biggest problems I think that we have 
is the lack of standards with regard to clinical data, to put it mildly. And one of the problems is we have so many standards that we don't have any, or the yes. standards we have are so loose. And to my mind, I'm glad to hear public health doing this because I think public health is the natural umbrella for all this stuff. Because public health is the only place that we can consolidate all of this data. So I'm really glad to hear that. I'd like to know more about what's going on. But the other thing I would like to do is encourage you to take, you know, take a strong stand. The point is that when the federal government tells the marketplace, I mean, vendors in the marketplace, this is what the marketplace is. If you want to make money, here's how you do it. That gives an incredible amount of control. And all the belly aching about software engineering and all this other stuff, I would just throw it out the window. Because if they want to be in the market, they've got the resources, they will do it. And what we're up against, in my view, is a bunch of organizations that think that somehow you can control things if you own them which I think in the 21st century is absurd, but it's a very difficult argument to make, and we need more federal leadership, I think, saying that to the vendor community, because it's actually better for everybody, a lot better for everybody, and, and it costs a lot more money, and there's much less value when we have all these conflicting ways of doing things. So I was just yeah. really very happy to hear what you said, and I want to give you as much Thank energy you. as I can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one that. thing's pretty clear, I can tell from our commissioner, that public health is actually trying to take over the government now. Um, <laughs> uh, well, just, just be aware of that. They're trying to get into everything. It used to be health and all policies. Now they just want to own it. It's, uh, it's, it's different. Other questions? Who's got a question back here? So this question is for Rafael Diaz. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not, um, uh, whether or not the uh, your agency HUD, when you're looking for affordable housing as you know part of addressing you know the public health and you know uh, 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 determinants, do you not only look at uh, finding housing but the quality of housing and the uh, area that the housing is in in terms of its impact? On, public, on health. And the reason I asked the question is because I, I was aware uh, some time ago that there was a study done or a research project that was done, I think it was here in Baltimore, uh, where actually the, the reason a child was visiting the, um, the emergency room often was because of the housing that they were living in and the mold in the housing. So the whole issue around asthma was not that she was having multiple asthma attacks just in general, but it really was around the housing. So the short answer is yes, absolutely. There's, there are so many determinants that are being identified and researched at HUD. Our policy development and research group looks at information that comes from education, from health and human services, and analyzes that information. The problem is it takes them a great deal research re reports. Uh, we've had uh, folks from education come and talk about how housing, the impact of housing to education, the fact that, uh, for instance, um, Paul, I think just mentioned, or no, Margot mentioned moving, uh, uh, or was it you, Emily? I can't remember. <laughs> Somebody mentioned moving, families moving and impacting their education. Some, but it, what happens is that uh, families, will, while they'll have a a voucher and be able to move into a better community, they won't move because their system of support is still back in that old community. And so they stay there and then they live in inferior housing. So all of these determinants, place-based housing is, 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 is a big impact on how families live. And we had the, um, the Matthew Desmond came to, to HUD to talk about his book, Evicted. And one of the things he looked at was how there's about two million folks that, because of whatever reason, crime or convictions, or they just can't get into public housing or they can't get vouchers, they live in this gap. And it would take, I believe he talked about $20 billion to provide housing for these folks. Whereas, and here's where we start to get into the data and the storytelling, right? The federal government subsidizes the wealthy at $270 billion for mortgage insurance, for, uh, for uh, mortgage premiums, uh, whereas it would just take another $20 billion to keep these people out of, out of this 
horrible downward spiral and improve the education, improve the health care, improve the, the crime rate, and improve so many aspects of society. $20 billion, I think that's a pretty, pretty easy sum of money to come up with. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel is uh, coming up to give us the hook. I did want to throw out one idea for the vendor community here. You know, we talked a little bit about EMRs and health records and so forth and the inadequacies. One of the conversations that comes up is how do we actually create some sort of a record system for local social services that actually allows the data collection and um, uh, roll up as needed going forward. So stay tuned for something later. Daniel? Thank you.